Welcome to the Resch Schoolhouse. Today, a distinguished group of women has gathered here. Women throughout history, in the recent past and into the present, have refused to let their voices be silenced. They have spoken out for equality and have broken barriers in every field. Let's meet these women and listen to what they have to say. Harriet Tubman, you guided many slaves to freedom through the Underground Railroad. Some people from your time say that you had seizures that enabled you to see visions of the future. Did you ever foresee that in 2021, many Americans would want to honor your courage by putting your picture on the U.S. $20 bill? Ain't no $20 bill going to make no kind of difference to me. God didn't put value in money. God put value in human beings. All the same, black and white, men and women. Men in power have always underestimated the value of women. I went into the South and brought enslaved people, men, women, and babies to freedom, and the slave owners were sounding the alarm. A radical abolitionist, maybe even that wide-eyed John Brown, or a whole network of Northern sympathizers were spiriting their slaves away. They never suspected it was just a little bitty five-foot ex-slave woman leading folks to freedom. All the time, God watched over me when I had my spells. All those times I went down south. I was never caught. And when I was nursing soldiers with dysentery and smallpox during the war, I never took sick. Ms. Anthony, you marched, you spoke, you were even arrested for fighting against voter suppression. Yet even though our last election, voter suppression was evident, will it ever be defeated? I was arrested in 1872 for voting illegally in Rochester, New York, by virtue of my not being a man, and I was taken to trial. The judge prevented the jurors from discussing the case and ordered them to find me guilty. I told the court, for women to get their right to voice in a government, they must take it as I have taken mine, and I mean to take it at every possible opportunity. I maintain that it is we the people, not we the white male citizens, nor yet we the male citizens, but we the whole people who form the union. And we formed it not to give the blessing of liberty, but to secure them, not to the half of ourselves and the half 
of our prosperity, but to the whole people. I was told to sit down. I was told to be quiet. Citizens who have been obstructed from voting must not sit down and must not be quiet. They must take their rights until they are secured for the whole people. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, you were a main force behind the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention on Women's Rights and a leader of the movement, alongside Susan B. Anthony. What does your 50-year friendship with Susan say about cooperation among women? We made a good team. Susan managed the business affairs of the movement and made speeches, and I did the writing. She said I was the brains and she was the hands and feet. Together, we published the women's newspaper, The Revolution, and formed the American Equal Rights Association and later the National Women's Suffrage Association. We were both abolitionists, but there were divisions between us and others fighting for equality. But we were opposed to the 14th and 15th Amendments that granted that right only to men. Where no individual in a community is denied his rights, the mass are the more perfectly protected in theirs. For whenever any class is subject to injustice, it shows that the spirit of tyranny is at work, and no one can tell where or how or when infection will occur.
Marie Curie, for your pioneering research on radioactivity, you were the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in 1903 and the only woman to win a second Nobel for your discovery of the elements polonium and radium. How was it that you, a woman, received a Nobel Prize? I will tell you the truth. I was a scientist. I believed in what I was doing. I had a supportive spouse who joined me in the research, and I knew that the power of what I was doing was more important than any role I would have done elsewhere. I felt entitled and enthralled by this opportunity to find the discovery of radium upon which everybody in this world has relied for x-rays. I'm sorry I became sick because I wanted to do more. I hope that the world understands I was doing it for the right reason. Eleanor Roosevelt, you are credited with transforming the role of First Lady from hostess to advocate. What are some of your biggest accomplishments? I did what needed care as it came along. Before the White House in the League of Women Voters and Women's Trade Union League, I pushed for legislation to protect women in the workplace. As First Lady, I held exclusive press conferences with women reporters to promote jobs for women and discuss issues that affected women. Change often took much too long. I suppose I was the first First Lady to have her own newspaper column, My Day, syndicated in 90 newspapers with 4 million readers. I wrote about many things, sewing projects for jobless women that prepared them for work in a shirt factory, the need to fight complacency after the Second World War when Europe was suffering food shortages, the hope for peace with the help of the United Nations, and I was not shy about advocating for or talking against candidates running for Congress. I was criticized for being too political. Women must make their voices heard in politics as well as other arenas.
Signora Carlo, you contracted polio as a child, suffered from spinal bifida, and when you were a teenager, you nearly died in a car accident that left you unable to bear children and in chronic pain. How were you able to endure these physical disabilities and create your art? Sufrí. A veces me desesperé, es verdad. Pero viví, pero no viví como víctima. Mi dolor no me definió. Mientras estuve postrada en cama por meses, mi pintura se convirtió en mi pasión. Como artista, desafié la idea tradicional de la belleza femenina. Mi arte describe el tema compartido por la mujer del que no se hablaría en un discurso público. El aborto, el aborto espontáneo, parto y lactancia. Me expresé como una mujer cruda y honesta. Hice lo que otras mujeres en mis tiempos no hicieron. Hablé en contra del capitalismo, fumaba, boxeaba y usaba pantalones. De mi cara me gustaban mis cejas y mis ojos y no suavizaría mis rasgos para ser aprobada por los hombres. Tuve hombres y mujeres como amantes. Sabía que yo era extraña, pero pensé que debería de haber alguien como yo que se sintiese extraño e imperfecto, de la misma manera que yo, y me la imaginaba pensando también en mí. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, of 113 justices who have served on the Supreme Court from 1789 to 2021, only five, including yourself, have been women. How much progress toward equality have women made over the last several decades? I'm asked, mostly by kids, if I always wanted to be a Supreme Court judge. To today's youth, judgeship as an aspiration for a girl is not all that outlandish. Contrast the fall of 1956 when I entered law school. Women accounted for less than 3% of the legal profession in the United States, and only one woman had ever served on a federal appellate court. Today, about half the nation's law students and more than one third of all federal judges are women including three of the justices seated on the United States Supreme Court bench. Women hold more than 30% of law school deanships in the United States and serve as general counsel to 24% of Fortune 500 companies. In my long life, I have seen great changes. The movement will continue. Women belong in all places where decisions are being made. It shouldn't be that women are the exception.
Sonia Sotomayor, you came from a humble background, but you now sit on the Supreme Court. The first female Supreme Court Justice, Sandra Day O'Connor, seemed to say that female justices would not change the view of the court when she stated, a wise woman and a wise man will come to the same conclusion. Do you think that women on the court enrich the view of the court? I would hope that a wise Latina woman with the richness of her experiences would more often than not reach a better conclusion, a more compassionate and caring conclusion than a white male who has not lived that life. I never backed away from writing a dissenting opinion like going against upholding the Muslim travel ban and the state's rights case supporting execution by lethal injection. I make a lot of public appearances, and not just at law schools. I like to speak at elementary schools, too. A nine-year-old girl once asked me what she should do to become president. I told her I was proud of her for dreaming big. I told her that the most important thing to do is read. I grew up in a Puerto Rican family in public housing in the South Bronx. I learned if you don't dream big, you can't become something big. I saw the possibilities of things that I could have never imagined without reading. Books are why I am a Supreme Court Justice. I shared my story in a book for children entitled Turning Pages. I dedicated it to my abuelita and all the women who served as role models in my life. Megan Rapino, you are a World Cup soccer champion, but some people say that athletes should stick to sports and not speak out politically. What do you say to that? I feel like it's actually everybody's responsibility to use whatever platform they have to do good in the world and try to make our society better, whether you're an accountant, an activist, or an athlete. Look at the impact the WNBA has had, keeping Breonna Taylor's name alive, helping to elect the first black senator from Georgia. Women's soccer filed the pay equity suit in 2019 against the U.S. Soccer Federation. The U.S. women's soccer team has won four World Cup tournaments. The men's team has never won the World Cup. Yet when it comes to pay, the women's team is less valued. Men are often compensated on the potential they show, not necessarily what they've done. Women are paid on what they've actually done, which normally, I would say, we outperform our contract. Our suit was dismissed, but we will never stop fighting for equality. You can't defeat someone who will not give up.
Greta Thunberg. As an environmental activist, but still a teenager, you called on the world to tackle climate change. You have been dismissed by some, many of them powerful men, as a mentally ill or hysterical child. How do you, as a young person with no powerful title, make your voice heard in battling the global crisis? I don't really like being in the center of attention. All my life, I have been the invisible girl at the back that no one sees or listens to. I thought I couldn't make a difference because I was too small. I expected when I started that if this is going to become big, then there will be a lot of hate. I think that must be because they see us as a threat. That means we are making a difference. It is too late to keep doing nothing. People are suffering. People are dying. Millions of displaced people in the world are women and children who have had to leave their homelands because they have lost crops and livestock and means to live due to drought and pest outbreaks because of climate change. Since our leaders are behaving like children, we will have to take the responsibility they should have taken long ago. We will never stop fighting for this planet, for ourselves, our futures, and for the futures of our children and grandchildren. We've highlighted the voices and stories of many women who contributed to the ongoing fight for equality for all, but we've only touched on the countless number of women who have woven the threads of their accomplishments through the tapestry of history. We encourage you, through libraries, bookstores, educational institutions, and museums, to pick an era or a field or an interest and learn more about the influence of women. We invite you to research the women in your own families to discover their stories, small and great, but all important.